Franz Schubert's short life was positioned in history such that his youthful flourishing, the only kind of flourishing he ever enjoyed owing to such an early death, was concurrent with Beethoven's full maturity and widespread fame. So it is that at the time Schubert lived, any large-scale composition in E-flat major was bound to invite comparison with the older composer's Eroica Symphony. And we have in the Younger's final piano trio, the one in that very key, a masterpiece worthy of comparison to that benchmark set well over two decades earlier. It is one of Schubert's last compositions, finished in 1827 and published shortly before his death the following year. Like Beethoven's heroic symphony, this is a work fraught with struggle, at times rising to crisis levels, and the ending is victorious. That victory is, however, won by different means than those Beethoven had employed. There is real dramatic genius at work here. The trio is set forth in the usual four movements and the key relations are conservatively traditional. E flat major for movements one, three, and four, the relative minor for movement two, and an A flat major trio section during the scherzo. Except for that last detail, I could very well have been outlining the Eroica Symphony. As in the Eroica, the first movement is the largest, a fine specimen of sonata form stretched to its limits, with all of its major sections organized as vast complexes. The Eroica Symphony's second movement is a great C minor funeral march, and Schubert's second movement here is also a C minor march, albeit of a very different character from Beethoven's. In both compositions, a fastidious E-flat major scherzo follows, and both of those scherzi include heroic-sounding contrasting trios. And, of course, both compositions end with very surprising E-flat major finales. To say more about their final movements at this point would, however, be to open comment not on the two compositions' similarities, but rather their great differences. This is nothing like Beethoven's finale, and it seems to me to complete an even more ambitious formal project than is the case of the Eroica. It's tempting to go on at great length about this composition's many wonders, but it is already a very long piece, and I would rather not risk wearing out my and Schubert's welcome. The recording is by the Beaux-Arts Trio, and I'll say a few words about each of the movements in turn. The first movement is a specimen of sonata form at the grandest of scales. The exposition is made up of large theme complexes, setting forth a great variety of affects, ranging from the heroic to the vehement to the wistful to the tender. The opening group's gestures are the heroic ones, beginning with a highly chiseled, bold, triadic phrase shouted in unison that is immediately called into question and then built out into something grand. The piece unfolds so organically that it's impossible to fix the bounds of a formal transition. The music simply goes where it will. The second group is just fantastic, beginning in the unlikely key of B minor with a wistful, balletic little theme that pirouettes gracefully through a maze of near-related keys until it finds its intended center on B flat, as tradition would lead us to expect for a splendid unfolding of distinctive, subtly related ideas. The closing is again heroic, and I have restored the exposition repeat that the Beaux-Arts trio omitted in this recording. I mean no disrespect, but this is, after all, what Schubert intended, and that connecting bridge means something completely different the second time through. The development is organized in three large cycles that all begin with the tenderest of the second group themes, continue with some beautiful rippling figurations that weave gossamer traceries around a slowly unfolding harmonic journey and culminate in a crisis. The recapitulation is mostly regular and a tutti cadenza opens the way to a coda that grants us a bonus statement of that beautiful second theme. It's all just wonderful. Thank you. 
As I indicated earlier, both the Eroica Symphony and the composition under review here proceed with a C minor march at this point, but they could hardly be more different. Schubert's march seems closely related to the first song of his Winterreise cycle, written the same year. I commend that to your attention. The song is Gute Nacht, and I'll link you to a performance in the description below. The famous cello solo is, of course, immediately affecting and appealing, certainly a lament, but perhaps an expression of more general sadness than of the focused grief one hears in the Eroica. Here we have not so much a cortege of mourners as the march of time, say, the tread of the inevitable, the sadness of the human predicament. One can hardly imagine anyone humming or whistling the main theme of the Eroica's march, but that wouldn't be at all unthinkable in this case. And it's equally true of the alternative theme, the one I identify as B on account of the movement's curious overall structure. This last does call for comment. The primary theme, the trudging C minor music, is given two statements, one for the cello and one for the piano. The piano statement turns in the direction of the relative major at the very end, opening the way for the contrasting theme, theme B, which begins as a cheerful and expansive thing. It is in the unfolding of this theme, however, that the drama happens, the music's temperature gradually rising to the boiling point with a big half cadential finish to bring the first return of theme A. This one is for the piano, with the violin and cello weaving a sometimes harmonized countermelody. This first return of the main theme is resolved deceptively and a turbulent development section ensues. There's plenty of angst in this music, broken by howls of pain and protest. After a season of trouble that encroaches on the terrible, the music glides into C major for a return of theme B, the really sweet theme, which unfolds at leisure. When that point is reached at which the crisis began earlier, the heat does indeed rise, but this time opening out into an extended season of C major triumph. The movement cannot end in that mode, of course, but the way it does end certainly raises questions and can be the cause of some puzzlement if the rest of the composition is not taken into account. For the final return of theme A, the return that one would expect to bring everything to a balanced and satisfying conclusion, does not fulfill that aim. It is instead a shriveled, misshapen, and uncertain thing, a husk of its former self groping aimlessly for a few bars before petering out in C minor. What on earth is that about? Is this a nod to the Eroica? Maybe, but that symphony's second movement, following that celebrated brokenness there at the end, does finish in a formally satisfying way. This movement, however, does not. Stay tuned.
Schubert will, in time, address that curious ending you just heard, but first it's time for the scherzo. This is a marvelous musical invention, a strict canon at the interval of a measure for most of its length. Sometimes the canon is harmonized, very often not. The way it's all worked out is just fantastic, and there is, unsurprisingly, a splendidly entertaining passage in the inharmonically respelled flat submediate key during the scherzo's second strain. The contrasting trio set in the subdominant key is a boisterous, strutting thing, just full of itself, but apparently harboring secret doubts and fears which now and then break through the bravado for a season of disclosure. There is the usual scherzo da capo, and by the end of this movement, all seems right with the world.
Well, perhaps all seems right with the world, but that doesn't mean that it actually is. There is still that strange ending to Movement 2 just hanging there unaddressed, and the time has come to address it. Movement 4 is another large-scale sonata form movement, this time featuring cyclic returns of the second movement's main theme. Therein lies Schubert's strategy for addressing an unsatisfying ending to Movement 2, and the solution will reveal the true status of that theme. Again, the thematic areas are large complexes. The cheerful first theme, for instance, unfolding over a considerable span of time in AABA form, and as in Movement 1, there is no identifiable formal transition. The music finishes confidently in E-flat major and then just falls without warning into C minor for theme two. Right away, we're treated to striking contrasts of the kind that so often enliven Schubert's music and hook his listeners. The boisterous major key first theme was in 6-8 time, that most rollicking of meters, but this fidgeting, anxious-sounding minor key alternative is set in square 2-2 two -two time, unfolding in multiple furtive-sounding statements. The return to 6-8 time brings the most flamboyant music of the entire composition, at times skating on the edge of the unplayable as fast semiquaver runs are exchanged between instruments otherwise engaged in a maddeningly syncopated extended hemiola. There's much more to this second group still, and it's all just breathtaking. The doing of it seems such an achievement that the exposition finally ends in a glow of well-deserved B-flat major pride. The music suddenly turns conspiratorial sounding as it slips into the development, its focus initially on the main theme. After a thorough treatment in B minor, that theme gives way to the first cyclic return of the primary theme of movement two, again sung by the cello with accompaniments drawn from music heard earlier in this movement. This B minor statement of the theme is complete and, while a pleasant thing to encounter, has not yet resolved movement two's deficit. There's more development, this time of that fidgeting second theme, and this also mounts to a musical crisis before subsiding graciously into a mostly regular recapitulation. It is during the coda that all is finally put to rights. This begins very much like the development, and even tracks it closely to a point, although its treatment of theme one is reduced this time, and movement two's cello theme when it returns in E flat minor is also reduced. Note the key, that's significant. The best way I know to explain the significance is this. If you extend the principles of sonata form in such a way as to include all four movements in a sort of super form, taking the E flat major first movement to represent theme one for purposes of this illustration, then the second theme is the C minor theme of movement two. And when it returns at the end of movement four in E flat minor, well, that's like the second theme returning reconciled during the recap, now in the tonic minor, which is exactly in line with sonata expectations. If you followed that, then you're all set to enjoy to the fullest the most wonderful thing that happens in Schubert's E-flat major piano trio. Like any good dramatist, he saved the best for last. I will not spoil it for you by describing it here. My running commentary will suffice. Happy listening.
Thank you.